Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our panel on multidimensional sustainability assessment for cities and regions. My name is Dr. Stanislav Edward Schmelev. I'm the founder and executive director of Environment Europe Foundation. On my right is Madame Maud Lelivier, the regional council of IUCN. To my left is Mr. Tadashi Matsumoto, the head of sustainable urban development at OECD. Connecting online, we have Professor Diru Tadani, the vice president of ICARP, the architect and urban planner. We also have Dr. Robert Johnson, the president of the Institute of New Economic Thinking in New York. Also with us is Mr. Bjorn Sigurdsson, the CEO of Sustainable Advantage and a former senior climate strategist at the city of Uppsala in Sweden. And also Mr. Guy Janssens, the head of Sustainable Investment Specialist at BNP Paribas in Belgium. Welcome. Without further ado, I would like to start our discussion by sharing some insights from our recent work on benchmarking cities around the world. At Environment Europe Foundation, we've developed a very thorough methodology that looks at different aspects of sustainability that you can see in the slide in front of you. We're looking at issues such as sustainable energy, sustainable transport, material flows, green space and biodiversity, social dimensions, preservation of natural and cultural heritage. On the outer rim of the diagram, you see specific indicators, specific KPIs that we use to benchmark performance of cities. And at the very heart, we have three themes that will be discussed today with our distinguished speakers, democratic governance, planning, and behavior of citizens. We've developed a very comprehensive set of sustainability criteria. They're really smart and sustainable criteria. And the reason why we have only 16, a maximum of 20, is that it's very hard to find information on multiple indicators of sustainability in the developing world, first of all, and also even in the developed world, when we look at, you know, detailed data from year to year. So we have economic indicators represented by incomes and regional gross regional product, inflation rates and unemployment, the smart indicators, which are represented by levels of innovation expressed in patents, creative industries, employment, the measures assessing the scale of the urban infrastructure. We also look at social indicators such as life expectancy at birth, the differentiation of incomes between the rich and the poor, the share of people with higher education, and a whole range of environmental indicators, which include emissions of CO2, which include air pollution expressed in PM concentrations, and various other <laughs> dimensions, including recycling rates and waste generation. The diagram that you see in front of you, roughly speaking, highlights the geographical scope of the database that we're dealing with. And using this data, we're able to look at, you know, relationships like you see in this chart, which connects, for instance, the proportion of people who are taking public transport, who are using cycles and also walk in the city with overall per capita CO2 emissions. Now, three case studies that I'm going to flag, after which we're going to discuss the results with our speakers, trying to answer the questions why some cities are performing better on sustainability and some are worse, and what would be done about this. So the first set is megacities, those powerful hubs of economic activity around <laughs> the world, like New York, like Rio de Janeiro, Tokyo, uh, London, Paris, Singapore, and so on. We looked at them with a lot of details and noticed in the first instance that there are no cities that are alike. There are cities which exhibit high level of economic development, such as Tokyo and Singapore. There are at the same time cities that exhibit very high levels of CO2 emissions per capita, like Sydney, for example, or Shanghai. And also there are cities sometimes where unemployment is high such as uh, the red line shows this, uh, Los Angeles or sometimes Berlin. As a result of our assessment, and here we use very sophisticated tools which are called multi-criteria decision aid. This is the methodology that was designed by Professor Bernard Roy in France. And I was fortunate uh, some many years ago to be a visiting professor at the lab that Professor Roy uh, headed at Medofin. So here in this chart, you see the assessment of megacities. 
The good news here is that we are able to change policy priorities, which means that we can look at the same situation with different eyes from different points of view. So in this particular instance, we have the priority of environmental over economic criteria. So in a sense, we think that, well, environment is very important. Let's think about how our assessment could play out there. And you can see that in our little sample, Singapore was flagged as a city which does rather well. And we put a picture of the city on the cover of this book that you see in front of you. Now to the second data set. The second data set is much more substantial. It's the set of global cities. We have about 60 uh, specimens here, 60 cities all around the world. You can see we cover Europe, we cover South America, North America. There are African cities, the cities in Asia and Australian Oceania. Here, and again, this is only a snapshot. There's a lot more information that expressed in the book. Just to start the discussion and to facilitate those debates, what we were able to establish is that under equal priorities, these cities like Stockholm, San Francisco, Paris, Tokyo, and Boston are featured at the very top of our ranking. If we focus on more environmental aspects of their performance, the top three cities are San Francisco, Stockholm, and Seoul in South Korea. And it has to be said that San Francisco is also featured at uh, the first place under economic priorities, and Stockholm features on the first place under social and smart priorities, which is really can be interpreted as a clear signal. We're very fortunate to have a representative who worked for municipalities in Sweden, and we'll be asking for some insights uh, about <laughs> why some of these cities are performing in this way. Paris is not too far from the very top in this global sample. It's number three under equal, so it's, I guess, and number three in smart, so it's a really good and strong position. And here in the second chart, we see the second half of the ranking. So I have to emphasize, this is not the whole world, it's our sample, right? So the fact that you're in line 60 doesn't mean that you're the worst in the world. It means that the performance is somehow lower than the other cities in the sample. But still here in this section, we have cities like Mexico City and Buenos Aires, Istanbul, Mumbai, Nairobi, Almaty, Delhi, Doha, Dubai, and so on. So that's the kind of, you know, the second piece of information I wanted to share with you. And finally, well, a little bit of a discussion on the urban CO2 function. We were able to design a model that uses a very clear econometric approach that combines several factors of urban sustainability performance applied to CO2 emissions per capita, very specifically, geography, technology, policy, and lifestyle. And we were able to assess CO2 emissions at the per capita level and also explain them and recommend which steps cities need to take to improve the situation on CO2. And we know how much decarbonization is an issue today. So I'll skip the coefficients. We could talk about it in detail. I think it's more important to concentrate on broad strokes results. So when we look at cities and regions in Europe, and this is the whole subject that was brought to the title of our discussion. In Europe, we have these NUTS, National Units of Territorial Organization. There's 1,300 plus of these units. And some of them are cities and some of them are rural areas. We were able to collect quite a significant amount of information on all of them and process this. And sometimes we had to generate new data. And we used our panel of indicators to assess their performance. I'm going to flag in front of you just a few layers of this database. The first one is gross regional product per capita. What you can see from this map in a big screen is that there are clearly these core periphery relations in the European space with some regions in the south, like in Portugal or Spain or south of Italy, or parts of Greece and Eastern Europe, like Romania, Bulgaria, in Poland, Czech Republic, and also Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, are still somehow lagging behind. At the same time, places like Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Scotland, Ireland, a lot of France, a lot of Germany and Benelux countries, together with Northern Italy, Austria, and maybe even the Catalonia in Spain are performing rather well. If we look at another example of the data that we were able to collect, the amount of innovation expressed in patents per thousand inhabitants. You also see here that innovation doesn't happen in Europe, you know, in an equally distributed way. 
there are specific hubs of innovations. And these are mostly regions in the south of Germany. There is a region in, around the city of Cambridge, as you can see, something around Malmö and Copenhagen, Stockholm in Sweden, Helsinki in Finland, and also a little bit in the south of France, and somewhere around specific regions in Italy and Austria. The data set that we created ourselves based on point source data is the PM pollution. So average annual amounts of PM pollution in the air. And you clearly see that, again, it's a very uneven picture with some regions and cities in Eastern Europe and also in the South exhibiting higher levels of air pollution. And finally, to the chart that I'm going to leave on the screen, before asking our distinguished panelists to express their views and opinions, I'm going to summarize this in a few words. So this is the final result of the assessment of cities and regions in Europe. We looked at the whole spectrum of 1,300 nuts three regions. And what we see here is that the best performing ones are located in Sweden, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. So we'll be asking about, you know, why it is so, but also, of course, you know, the performance of German municipalities and cities and many, many most French, actually, and some in the UK and some capital cities in Spain and maybe the region of around Rome and also actually the region around Warsaw and Helsinki are also doing rather well. But this is, this is I would like to emphasize, this is overall. This is on, based on all different dimensions of sustainability that we've just discussed. So I think it will be a good moment for me to stop and to use all our time to discuss this with my distinguished panelists. And also, you know, after we have used maybe five to eight minutes each to open this for a discussion with you, with the audience, to be able to have a two-way dialogue. So I would like to direct my first question to our representative of ICN and ask about the, the foundations, really, because nature and ecosystems that surround the city and also that are present within the city play an absolutely vital role, right? We all breathe and drink the fundamental elements that come from the natural world. So how ecosystems really you know, determine the sustainability performance of a city and why it is important? Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Schmele, for inviting me to join the panel uh, as a representative of IUCN. And thank you for this uh, very, very exciting and interesting maps uh, to summarize uh, what is the situation um, at this stage in Europe. I will focus maybe more on nature and uh, ecosystem. That is a priority for IUCN linked with the climate change, uh, battle against climate change crisis. The importance of local action in particular in the city level is more and more acknowledged by international community. It is at the forefront of actions to tackle the climate and biodiversity crisis. And they, because, as you say, they, they concentrate the most polluting activities. They are often point, of course, as roots of those crises. And uh, but it mostly represent for us in IUCN the sources of opportunities. Today, cities are evolving. It's not the same as in the past. And the sustainable city is a major objective of urban planification. Uh, nature in the cities can not only help nature, but also to reach the challenge of uh, climate change, heat wave, flood, air quality, human uh, well being, as we saw with the, the COVID crisis and the health. Uh, we are working um, at, that, at this stage in IUCN for one health, that means a place where it's possible to live uh, without zones, without pollution connecting with nature, but also with sustainable uh, development for energy. Sustainable cities are deeply connected uh, to survival of a uh, natural world. And in IUCN, that is, um, as you expressed, the most important network for nature and conservative uh, conservation of nature. And we, we think there is an important role to play for cities in shaping our collective urban future. Investing in the ecosystem conservation makes economic sense. It's not only to, to help nature, but ecosystems provide natural solutions to many challenges cities face by offering numerous services such as clean air, filtration, flood prevention, noise reduction, 
as well as climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. These can help to save money and generate also economic benefits and a better life. The question is now how it's possible to live in the future in very important megalopolis and, megalopolis and, and big cities. So um, IUCN carries a new project to mainstream the best, best practice and the feedback from initiative uh, cities, a part are on the map, from the Sweden, from Uh, of course, Germany, in UK, we have a, a lot of good example and very interesting um, uh, feedback from these cities. So we, we have three main tools to identify that. Cities with nature, network nature, and uh, grow growing. And for many years, the uh, IUCN defined and uh, support the concept of nature-based solution, I think. If you are interested in the COP, you heard that word and previously, and it was one of the main points in Glasgow for the negotiation for climate. Unfortunately, it was not until the end, but we are very, uh, we have a lot of hope for the future in the Egyptian and maybe also in Montreal for the COP15 uh, to cross the double COPs. So nature-based solution is not a slogan, it's not a, it, but it's concrete uh, action to protect an um, ecosystem. And um, we, we are totally convinced that uh, trees and green space could regulate the temperature and prevent the uh, flooding. Wetland restoration could uh, prevent uh, coastal erosion, and um, we can also avoid expensive uh, water treatment with plants or with a uh, nature-based solution. IUCN developed um, a global standard for nature-based solution to help cities with this solution. So it's not a slogan, it's not something to put uh, in a political program, but it's really, really important uh, tools and targets, with targets to reach for each city who, who are engaged with. And um, I, I will maybe highlight that with uh, some example of Paris. You quote Paris in your presentation, and uh, I'm elected, I'm, I'm representative of IUCN, but I'm also elected in Paris. I'm a councillor of Paris uh, city, at Paris City Town. And Paris, it's a very interesting example because it's a historical city with a lot of difficulties to adapt. Uh, it's not exactly the same when you have to build new buildings or you, when you have to renovate older, older center uh, as Paris. And it's, uh, it's the heart of the urban agglomeration of a region and the capital of France. So we have a lot of roads, difficulties to adapt uh, uh, Paris. But despite that uh, art situation, I mean, from a biodiversity perspective, we count almost uh, 3,000 wildlife species between uh, 2010 and 2020, plants, animals in uh, roads, streets, cemeteries, railways, in the sea river, and so on. So. And Paris presents a combination of issues, clean water, water filtration, fruit prevention, noise reduction, The, this is where ecosystem service comes into play. Cities, I think, we, in that perspective, can and could be leaders for change. And um, it's um, absolutely necessary. So, so to highlight that with a simple example, we develop in Paris oasis, not in the desert, but in schools. It's to transform uh, schoolyards into uh, school gardens to prevent uh, the effect of climate change and to provide children with more comfortable living, living space. We also project, we have also project uh, for bird protection uh, to creating new nesting, nesting sites in the, in the city. And we have also collaborative action uh, as a, with permit for greening. That means it's possible for residents to grow plants in the street, in the street, not in the garden, in the street. It's a way to, to have a very inclusive uh, solution uh, for the street. So um, in the IUCN, uh, we organized a new urban alliance in 2016, and uh, that is a quite a platform that reunites a lot of partners uh, who um, develop also uh, examples and uh, highlight what is uh, the best practice. And this uh, urban alliance catalyzes and involves a new project and partnership for greening cities with the three tools that I quote, uh, cities for with nature, organized with IUC, but also with ICLE. I think everyone in that room knows ICLE. It's a unique initiative for recognize the value of nature in and around cities um, across the world. 
The second tool is a network uh, metro. It's a resources for nature-based solution community, creating opportunities for local, regional, and international cooperation to maximize the impact. And the third is Raw Green. It works with cities using nature-based solution to meet climate change and water issue, not climate change and biodiversity, but water. And um, it creates very uh, interesting, uh, resilient way. Maybe to conclude, we, we decided at the last Congress of IUCN, we have a Congress uh, each uh, four years. Uh, the, the last one was in Marseille in France. And we decided to have a call for nature in cities' agendas inside the IUCN Alliance, the Urban Alliance. And we recognize the role of the new agenda approved by United Nations in Habitat 3 in Quito four, five years ago, and we are we are paying the, the global target for cities. So um, that is not only metro, it's very, very more than metro, and we're absolutely convinced that climate change and biodiversity crisis should be the uh, same uh, battle. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, I would like to give the floor to a representative of OECD, Tadashi Matsuwata, and ask him about the role of uh, good governance and good policies and also the best practices that you can see also on this map from the point of view of those cities and regions that are managing better on sustainability. The floor is yours. Thank you, Stanislav. Welcome to the session. Um, I'm very honored to be here and then to share my thought on excellent work that was done by uh, Environmental uh, Europe Foundation. And uh, my uh, own field is uh, urban planning, national urban policy, and, uh, but I'll also, you know, OECD is very much strong on these statistics as well, especially the subnational statistics side. So I like to give my um, views on, on this work uh, from those perspectives. To start with, of course, uh, answering your question, how useful, you know, this type of work for policy making, of course, you know, with no doubt, but I like to start with, you know, how this is uh, really useful po for policy makers, I like to give a bit of uh, thought. So first for cities, it's absolutely, it's important to see internationally, or at least domestically, you know, comparable indicator framework, particularly in this case, the scale of Europe and comparing uh, your city with others is quite important. And I'm quite interested in also the way that you aggregated the, you know, several different indicators into the sustainability index. There, I think, you know, technically there are many, many, you know, expertise that should be, you know, already concentrated in this work. But I appreciate that because um, it's quite important for cities, you know, to see as a whole, are we doing well in, in sustainability or not? And then if you see, well, uh, we are not so good, then you can disaggregate the data into the elements and then see it, you know, what are the, the issues, what are the challenges that we should uh, prioritize to address. And so this is absolutely useful too. What we do as an OECD is, for example, you know, similar work is what we call OECD Wellbeing Index. So it's, you know, like 11 different dimensions and measure a country's, first of all, well-being uh, performance. We extended it to the regional level of the OECD countries, meaning like sub-national level, which is, I think it's uh, not two level. And then uh, we also extended that work into SDG indicators. So this goes to um, functional urban area, so metropolitan level, metropolitan scale. What we are not doing it is this aggregation. You know? We are showing, for example, in the case of 11 well-being index, we can show it like a flower, you know, and the score is going to be seen by like a petal of the flower in the different directions. On SDGs, we have also another way of showing the, the performance, but we are not creating this composite indicator. So this is something that is interesting. At the national level, this type of exercise is very, very important as well. Uh, especially, I like to highlight the needs to for national governments to identify geographical disparities of sustainability, which is crucial because when, again, coming back to the SDG examples, if you are, <coughs> or if UN is uh, um, asking countries to measure SDG performance and the reporting exercise is really for national aggregated number, right? National average. 
However, if you look at regions, so for example, I'm um, what, seeing this map and then interestingly, Spain, for example, have a two, I guess it's Madrid and, and Barcelona region performing rather well, but then seeing uh, you know, other parts in a dark color. So it's very important. Of course, you know, local governments are doing it by themselves, you know, how they perform for SDGs or sustainability. But again, with this internationally comparable measures, seeing uh, this disparity with, uh, so how far is your city from the national average is quite important. It's also important for cities, of course, you know, to see, well, national average is here, my city is here. And that also gives a reason for prioritization. But national government also, it's very important to understand and identify this performance disparity and then, um, then use it for their you know, place-based policy making. Particularly, I like to also mention that in the last 20 years, particularly, you know, well, after the financial crisis in 20, uh, 2008 or 9, actually, we are seeing in economic and social indicators that national average well, actually, in Europe, for example, or OECD countries, <laughs> national disparities, meaning like the performance difference across countries are shrinking, so converging. However, if you look at the disparity within countries, so at the subnational level, disparity is increasing. So this is an important factor. And then also, it's very important if sustainability is tracing the same trend or not. You know, if uh, this regional disparity is really increasing in the sustainability measure, that is a really uh, worrying uh, issue and the national government needs to do something about it. Yeah, so if, you know, this data can be also tracked in a time series, that would be really interesting. My, uh, <coughs> my final point is perhaps, uh, you know, also a bit of future work, perhaps if you look at this map, of course, this is not three, but we are quite interested in looking at the metropolitan scale. So we discussed a little bit previously, but it's really nice. For example, if you see the example of, uh, I don't know, Paris, perhaps, I cannot see it <laughs> very closely, but actually in some cases, the core city is performing very well, but uh, the suburban Absolutely. or surrounding cities are not performing well. And then here we have a governance issue, as you, you mm -hmm. already mentioned. And actually, again, this type of data is a good way to show, you know, really the, this, um, the needs for the good metropolitan governance. And if also you can show it as a function of an area or metropolitan level, then you can compare the performance at the metropolitan scale. Then if you are doing good in the metropolitan governance, perhaps the score can be shown as a good score, as aggregated, you know. So it's, it's interesting to expand the work into that direction. And uh, yes, I, I would stop here, but uh, again, you know, I appreciate this uh, work and I'm very happy to support that mm -hmm. if for application. Thank you very much. So much. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we really do appreciate the support because uh, the foundation is a charitable organization and we will need to search for, for grants and various philanthropic donations to continue all our work. I would like to give the floor to our third distinguished speaker, Professor Diro Tadani, who is connecting with us from Washington, D.C., and he's going to be on the screen in a second. Yes, we can see you, Diro. I know that you have some slides that you wanted to share. Could we have the slides on the screen, please? So uh, thank you for this opportunity. As an architect, I can't talk without slides or images, so give that I have to do this this way. But the three uh, cities that you mentioned, you can see a very recognizable, we have San Francisco, Seoul, and Stockholm. And that's one of the keys issues that people like to be in places where their city is recognized. Okay, so the, from an urban design point of view, cities need to have a clear civic space and a public realm, uh, an identifiable public realm that's beautiful, that people can enjoy. And I think San Francisco and Stockholm, which I know both those cities well, have that. And so uh, is trying to do that. They have actually recently removed a highway that ran through the city and they lit a river, a stream, 
and made a linear park out of it. So this idea of actually making public spaces that people can enjoy is extremely important. That's why I think that's one of the reasons that makes cities really beautiful and great. The other is that all these cities that seem to be performing well uh, are actually traditional cities. Uh, they have new sections to them, but there is a traditional form there that is very attractive and it has an authentic character. Unlike some of the newer cities that have been built that wipe out the existing fabric, uh, these cities have maintained the existing fabric and added more buildings and spaces to the city. The next point is education. Uh, all these cities are hubs of education. They're centers of excellence. And that's very important in terms of attracting and keeping knowledge-based workers. Now, young people, it seems, and I'll show you some, uh, some statistics, uh, I mean, some factors that we have been correlating, really like to, be, to have name recognition. They like to be associated with cities that are recognizable. They're talking to other people across the world through the internet. And when they say, you know, I'm from here, they don't want to name a place that no one has heard of. A lot of times people will cheat and say, you know, I'm in Washington, D.C. They might be 30 miles in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., but they associate with a place that has name recognition. The other factor is that these cities are connected. They're easy to get to. They're hubs of transportation and mobility. The cars are usually compact, and that's the part that knowledge-based workers actually hang out in and want to be in. And then finally, they're complete in the sense that all your needs, medical, health, et cetera, can actually happen or be, are accessible within those cities. So just to make a what they're now doing as these research facilities without all those other things that make life possible tends to fail those attempts. Now, just to kind of continue on this theme, Richard Florida's work kind of has talked about the three T's and for successful places, it's an embracing of technology, fast Wi-Fi, fiber, et cetera. That is absolutely essential. And one of the essential qualities for cities that are trying to raise their level of standards and the quality of life is, you know, an embracing of technology. The second point is tolerance. People want to, young people especially, want to move to places that are tolerant. That has to do with sexual preference, race, creed, and also economic variance. So the fact that you're tolerant, now San Francisco, for instance, is now facing a lot of problems because it has built way too much for the wealthy or the uh, high income group and is really suffering now because there is no affordability there. So that's a trap that you can get into with letting the developers get greedy and just build high end, high income places. And then finally, talent. And this is where universities and colleges play a big role because people want to be where there's other talented people want to be where there are talented people. So that's kind of a migration, it seems, that if you hear about a place that has a lot of uh, talent pool, that's where people want to are attracted to. Now, we've done a lot of research in terms of uh, the work that we've been doing about trying to help smaller cities and smaller towns revitalize. And our research has shown a couple things. One is people want, young people especially, want access to entertainment. And that's probably one of the reasons why Seoul is doing so well. It has an open drinking law. It's a 24-hour city. And there's a lot of entertainment of all kinds, uh, different cultural uh, activities constantly. And San Francisco is the same. And Stockholm is also one of the centers for culture. The second is affordability, this range of housing types. They're not always looking for the kind of suburban house for two, you know, mother, father, and a couple children. They're looking for alternates and a little more, you know, sharing, common places, etc. So that, that makes these places affordable, where you can, uh, the units are designed so that they can be shared by multiple non-related people. Access to uh, health and fitness and recreation is extremely important. Bicycling, 
all the re outdoor recreation, uh, and these places have that in quick, close proximity. Mobility of all kinds, that you're not always dependent on your automobile to get from point A to point B, but there's a lot of transit. And I think you know, cities like Seoul are investing in that kind of infrastructure where San Francisco is improving, already has it, and Stockholm too. So this idea that these cities are walkable, bicycle accessible, and you don't really need to rely on a car, which is an expensive, unwasteful piece of investment. And then of course, jobs. All this does produce jobs and that's where people wanna go. And that's why we have this migration from rural areas to cities. And the cities that offer the most amount of jobs seem to be, of course, filled with uh, attracting people. And then finally, this notion of overall uniqueness, that your city is associated with something that is internationally known. And this falls into the idea of, you know, this recognition or this name recognition of your city, that things are happening there and people know about it. New Orleans with the Mardi Gras, for instance, or, you know, Daytona with their uh, races, et cetera, car races. And then finally, from a policy point of view for the city, it is to provide places for entrepreneurs and incubation of new businesses. Entrepreneurs and non new businesses cannot afford new space. And that seems to be one of the key mistakes. If you're going to build new space, it has to be highly subsidized so that people can incubate new businesses. And that is generally why cities that have a stock of old buildings or warehouses or cheaper uh, cheap rental spaces seem to do really well. And that's where the kind of historic fabric comes into play. These places have not been invested in <clears throat> highly, and therefore you can incubate businesses. And people you know, want to take their talents and the variety of different businesses that you can incubate in these places that are attractive. So that is from a city point of view, you need, you talked about patents and where all those cities have those secondary spaces where young people can go and innovate without the high cost of, you know, class A office space. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear. This has been remarkable. Thank you so much for this uh, useful set of insights, which we really appreciate. Now I would like to turn to another speaker, namely Bjorn Sigurdsson. Bjorn, you worked for municipality of Uppsala in Sweden and yes. know very well the, the culture of Sweden and the tradition. And I would like to simply return to the slide where we've shown the, the different cities and regions in Europe and ask you, why Sweden? You know, what makes it so special and unique that allows us to see that they really are doing a tad better than everybody else on sustainability overall? And that means CO2 emissions. That means recycling of waste. That means unemployment and, and inflation and a whole range of other social characteristics. Please, we, the floor is yours. Yeah. Bjorn. Thank you very much, Stanislav. And, and thank you for inviting me to this um, panel. And I heard very ma many interesting points of you. An elaboration on, on the cities so far, it, it, it seems very interesting. I. I do have an experience of working both in, in Stockholm and Uppsala. And, and I think uh, the question is, of course, very interesting that why is, is Swedish cities performing so well in the outskirts of, of Europe? We, with just 10 million people in, in Sweden and, and a large country, so we're very <laughs> dispersed, a few cities of any size, and still we're doing fine. I, will, I think there is a couple of things I would like to, to attend to them. But first, I would like to say that, that um, I'm uh, presently one, one of the things I do is I'm a senior advisor to World Wildlife Fund, WWF, and their City Challenge, One Planet City Challenge, which this year some 280 cities around the world participated in. And they award every, every second year uh, the best city of climate work both mitigation and adaptation. And Uppsala was uh, awarded a global winner in 2018. And now into this year, 2022, again, the Swedish cities, Lund. And in comparison with previous years, these mega cities, some of them that you have pointed out, like Seoul, Paris, 
but also Cape Town, Mexico City, La Ciudad de México, and now Bogota, Vancouver. But why do small cities from Sweden do well in this kind of ranking and, and friendly competitions? I think there is four points. First of all, the general social development, of course, in, in society. And this is, goes for Sweden, I guess the regional culture in the Nordic countries, uh, part of, of Holland and, and so on. There will be no sustainable uh, development without peace, without working for equality, without a democratization, democracy in society where people Giro, you, you mentioned tolerance, for example. So I think that goes very much in, in terms of flat organizations, no hierarchies and no uh, excess of, of uh, respect for, for upper levels of, of administration and so on. So I think that is, that, that is the basic, of course, and, and the society being transparent. We have the, the principle of public openness. Everything has to be public and open. You can participate. I think that is the basis for, for very much of everything that comes later on and the possibilities for cities and regions then to work within such a context. So that is the first, I think. And then in Sweden the men, uh, and, and in the region in, in general, collaboration is a, a culture. We, we collaborate. That is how we do things. That is how we move the sustainability goals we collaborate and it's between private sector and, and people and municipalities and NGOs and so on. So culture. Secondly, it's institution, institutional tools and the willingness to act with these tools and actually do something. I think that Swedish cities is, is maybe quite unique in, in many countries because Swedish municipalities, because it's of, often urban and rural area together, has their own, they are independent. They rule themselves. They taxate, they tax their citizens. They have the plan monopoly. They, uh, they have, uh, they do local traffic regulation. They can erect uh, and, and to um, public companies like energy utilities, create district heating systems. They can do system shifts. They can act to foster innovation, to foster supporting innovation organizations for innovation and entrepreneurship. They can do a lot of things. They have mandatory tasks for um, education, social care, etc planning, but all the rest is voluntarily. But Swedish municipalities and, and primarily those that stands out in terms of abating carbon dioxide, mitigation targets and, and, and innovation and, and so on. That is where both on the political level on, and on the administrative level, there is a willingness to act and take responsibility for the overall development of the local society. Not only just a school or, or, or care daycare center or something, but a, a, this is the local democratic organization. And we take a full responsibility for overall things. And we do it together with our citizens. And we do it together with our companies and other organizations in a collaborative sense, matter, way, method. Okay. So institution, institutional tools, and, and not tools. Collaboration is not a tool, it, 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 by, by, by law, it, it's an attitude. And then thirdly, and, and third part of that, institution tools and, and willingness to act, you have also, you have to act. And I think there is, is a very uh, many, some things that I think of in terms of more towards um, sustainability in terms of uh, ecology, climate change, uh, health, uh, things like that. Uh, cities have taken responsibility when it comes to traffic regulations, but also when we have the oil crisis in the 70s mm -hmm. and, and also the health problems with the <laughs> in every building and 
cars in every street. The cities acted on that, and they did that by constructing energy companies that constructed the city district heatings with combined heat and power. So this is major health, major energy security, better economy, more energy efficient as a system, but it's a system shift. And if I, if I should um, you know, round up maybe, I think uh, cities can uh, and should, apart from all what they already do, and I think uh, Professor Tarani, Jiro, you, you pointed out very much of everything that they should do and think about. But I do think that um, we need system change to combat both poverty, biodiversity loss, and, and the climate emergency crisis. And cities do have the powers to, to mm. inflict system shifts and start thinking about what could that be more than district heatings, whatever. Taking charge of uh, coordinated uh, logistical hubs, changing thinking from parking, lots of parking houses to mobility hubs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think there is a lot of things to do for cities in the future to even be even better. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bjorn. And now I would like to give the floor to our other distinguished speaker, the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, Robert Johnson. We saw some spectacular performance from San Francisco. Uh, how could you explain that? That's the first sort of opening question. And also, uh, how do you see other cities from the US potentially benefiting from uh, you know, the work that we've shared on sustainability? Because as far as we could see, some of them are not yet doing so well, at least as uh, brilliantly as San Francisco, for example. Well, thank you, uh, Stanislav. I want to first off applaud the work of Environment Europe. This set of information that you've compiled and shared with all of us is obviously a wonderful exercise in complex pattern recognition and in searching for and finding the constructive pathways through ex what I'll call multi dimensional examples. So, thank you for. Uh, the inspiration in, in, in igniting our curiosity. Behind me is from my hometown growing up, a statue called the Spirit of Detroit. And as I listened to you, the theme that occurred to me was the Spirit of Detroit quotes from the Bible. And I'm not trying to be religious here, but it's now the Lord is that spirit and where, there's, where the spirit of Lord is, there is liberty. As I heard our earlier speakers talking about San Francisco, I spend, I own a home since 2005 uh, in the outskirts of San Francisco. I spent a lot of my summers there. And I do think that there is a, what you might call a sense there of vitality, of hope. There are some, what you might call environmental characteristics, which are very hard to replicate. For instance, in the summer, with the exception of some recent bursts, the temperatures usually do not exceed 80 degrees. There's not a lot of need for air conditioning. In the winters, the temperatures rarely, rarely get below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But so there, there are some gifts that affect their statistics, but there is also which I called the mode of production, which was unlike the industrial Midwest, very digital and, and not carbon consuming. I want to uh, underscore an extraordinary piece of work that I came across earlier this year, the Luhan Academy, run by Chen Long, created a study called Digital Circular Economy for Net Zero. And they have emphasized Michael Spence, the Nobel laureate who spent time at Stanford University, Chen Long, Patrick Bolton from Princeton, uh, as well as a, another constellation of people on their team, explored this. And they found that being at the vanguard of digital transformation is correlated with the results that they're seeing and what they call the circular economy the ability to, which you might call, 
reuse or I'll just put it, sell your used clothes or your cars or what have you so that we're not consuming all of what mother nature has offered humankind. In San Francisco, I see a tension. There is a very democratic spirit, but there is also the kind of spirit that Adam Curtis, the great documentarian from BBC, has emphasized in his series called All Wrapped Up by In Machines of Loving Grace, which is there's a kind of libertarian anti-government sensibility that must be overcome for San Francisco to stay on this path. And I do think it, it has that potential. And there's also the beauty in San Francisco of what you might call a multicultural awareness, particularly the importance of Eastern philosophy in the context of San Francisco, rather than just what I'll call Cartesian enlightenment perspective. Though I must add, and uh, my wife and a woman named Rachel Gossel were the founders of something called the Perception Institute, the experience for African-Americans in San Francisco proper has been very, very unsatisfying and, and unsuccessful. And many of them have migrated to places like Richmond and, and left there. But when I look at San Francisco, the digital base, the enthusiasm for the future reminds me of growing up in Detroit. There's an old saying in Detroit, Detroit is the cloud that hangs over the future of America. Detroit deteriorated. When I talk to people in places like West Virginia, where there's a lot of coal burning, they say, yes, we have to do climate change, but they're going to do to us what they did to Detroit and Cleveland. And they become resistant, both at the national level and at the regional level, to the transformations that are needed. What I really think is that the transformational assistance becomes very important. My family came from Scotland and Gothenburg, Sweden. And uh, Peter Goodman, through a, uh, who writes for the New York Times, through a wonderful man, Leif Progratsky, who used to be a minister in the Swedish government, acquainted me with a perspective that I think is very, very important to the United States right now. Peter wrote a story in December of 2017 called The Robots Are Coming and Sweden Is Fine. And it's a parable about the transformation that innovation presents. It can, it can be what you might call a possibility frontier that will require transformation, retraining, et cetera. But the, the people in Sweden greeted this enthusiastically because they trusted that they would have their children's education, their pension, and transformational assistance. Goodman contrasted this with the United States. This was 2017 in the middle of the Trump administration, where the, which you might call diseases of despair and other things were being highlighted. That in America, our capacity, and, and by the way, this contrasts, the older models were America has a flexible supply side. So America's going to be dynamic, reallocating resources and have higher productivity and quote, Europe was sclerotic. Where Goodman emphasized is without caring for your community, without being part of a whole, the resistance politically to potential, to transformation, to a higher and better standard of living for everyone would be at risk. And we are seeing that in the United States. San Francisco has been at the vanguard of innovation, high, which you might call value added per capita. And maybe they are the beacon of where America should continue to go. But Muhammad Ali's most famous poem, which is in the Guinness Book of the World's Record, is two words, me, we. And we are on a pendulum with too much me and not enough we in the United States. And as the great Indian author Rohit Mystery 
wrote in his book titled A Fine Balance, Life is a Fine Balance Between Hope and Despair. And removing despair through regeneration of community, perhaps using the negative example of Detroit and the positive example of San Francisco might make not just America, but the whole world a safer and more satisfying place. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For it. This is really, really insightful. I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Guy Janssen, who is managing a huge investment portfolio at the BNP Paribank Investment Bank. And the question to you uh, that I would like to put would be, what is the role of ESG investment in transforming our cities? Because ultimately, and we hear it at the World Open Forum here at the UN uh, every day, that you know, it's fine to have big you know, projects and programs, but it all boils down to investment, you know, finding the capital, making sure that the projects are run well and deliver and so on. And what, what best practices could you flag uh, from around the world in your sphere that we could actually, you know, aspire to. The floor is yours. So thank you very much for inviting me and um, uh, Stanislas. And I think also as an investor, we can make a difference on sustainability. And just before I was having the words, the difference was also being mentioned between sustainability and development in Europe and the US. We are BNP Paribas, we are the biggest bank in Europe and we work with hundreds of different asset managers worldwide, including a lot of American asset managers. And for us, it's important to see where can we put the money uh, of our clients on a sustainable way. And we invest in a lot of sustainable teams. And, and one of the teams is also a mega trend is, is also cities, uh, mega cities, urbanization is very important, not only in emerging markets, but also in uh, Western Europe uh, and also in the US. And we've seen that there are opportunities for us to invest because today, if you live in, in, in a city like London or you live in, in Paris or in New York, uh, you see that yeah, the, the quality of life has to improve because prices are very high in those cities. So we see that the trend is prices going up. So it means that people who live in those cities, they want to have also a better condition for their life. And we work with um, different resources from uh, different banks, but also with uh, McKinsey. And we, we calculated what can be done on sustainable cities to improve the quality of life, quality of life indicators. Those companies who, who give solutions for the improvement of quality of life indicators are the companies in which we invest. For example, on healthcare, what is important, of course, we want also that the disease burden has to decrease. And we calculate that it's possible in, in mega cities, in, in smart cities, to decrease with 15%. Also related is the environmental quality, greenhouse gases to reduce also 15%, water consumption 20 30% waste 20%. So this is important also on, on, on the health and also environmental quality. Safety also been uh, discussed already is important. And for the safety mm -hmm. indicator, we got fatalities is important also to reduce with 10%. Emergent response time, for example, if you have a big problem, 20% can be reduced on time. Crime incidents, uh, safety for the people, of course, 30, 40%. We saw the example many years ago, what happened in New York. So the, these are indicators which are very important for us, how you can improve by science, but also by technology, the quality of, of a city. Uh, jobs, education, very important, of course, uh, if you want to have a smart city and, and also if you see also that uh, it's an investment opportunities. Education is first key also going forward for the next generation. Uh, and also important is the social connectedness and, and civic uh, participation. Citizens feel connected to the local community. So local community, but also with the local government. And the cities, they, they have an advantage because they're quite big. So they can be independent and, and they can be independent on a lot of things. The globalization makes our lives very difficult. <coughs> it is when they are independent uh, and they have more possibility on education, but also possibility on the resources. Yeah, there can be a huge improvement. 
Next to that, what is also important for us is at the resource carity, what we see today in the world, population is increasing, but we see that certain cities that they can recycle their, all their waste because cities are becoming in, mostly more bigger. 100% recycling, that is what we have to go for. And, and we see examples like plan for 2030, for example, in Amsterdam. Uh, it's a nearby example, I live in Brussels. So, and that we use the, the waste uh, for the energy. Not in you, but it's very easy and you can be independent. And then you also have energy independent. Very important today in Europe. It be happening with the war, of mm, course, yeah. Ukraine. So, and also water independent. So, so th these are things which is for us very important. And if you look for the financial opportunities, it's mainly in the housing. Still important in investing in housing. So the real estate that we invest a lot in it because it's more than 30% of the cities improving the housing infrastructure. Uh, is 16%, health 7%, education 9%. Recreation also mentioned is an important sport, uh, entertainment. These are the, the teams in which we invest. And we make the prediction because if we invest a lot of money, we have to see what is the liquidity of those investments going to the smart cities. And we calculate on average, on yearly basis, 2.1 trillion. 2.1 trillion uh, capex expansion is going in that direction, which is very good and is also in line with the Sustainable Development Goals, as a gene number 11, Sustainable Cities. Technology is important, software, property analysis, as explained, but also real estate lending, sharing buildings, sharing, but also cars, uh, um, as explained also before by other speakers. We have to do more on circular, circular economy, sharing economy that is the future for cities cities have to be also more green so i saw an example many years ago in, in milan uh, in italy that there were also a lot of apartments and on the top of the apartments there were green buildings there was also some sort of a garden so we have to be creating gardens for example in apartments so also to reduce the co2 and to improve the quality of the people living in the cities what is also important Flexible offices, for example, childcare solutions, digital healthcare, digital food, but also looking for storage uh, important also in cities. These are things that have to be more improved. But also we, as a bank, we exclude certain activities, which uh, yeah, is negative for a city. Uh, and mm -hmm. oil and gas, fossil fuels, they have to be banned in cities. We have to go to hydrogen, we have to go to green energy, that is important, recycling. Recreation is important, but gambling, yeah, these are the things that we want to exclude and more focus on, uh, on sports, uh, on, 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 on other activities, uh, which is important on also quality of life. On the healthcare sector, uh, to reduce also the tobac, tobacco is important, pesticides. So everything that is bad for human being, that is also have to be excluded. So we invest in companies who find solutions and for smart cities and companies who have a negative impact, these are the companies which we exclude. We don't give money anymore. And this has a huge impact. So if you one example, in 2018, <clears throat> the financial sector decided uh, with, with the United Nations to ban in, in a lot of countries and in banks, not all banks, the tobacco industry. And we've seen that tobacco was doing very well past the S&P 500. But the last couple of years, since 2018, that's not the case anymore. And we've seen also that on the website from Philip Morris, we see that they are in transition. We go to a smoke-free world. Of course, it's a, a huge transition, not for today, it's not for next year. But as a bank, as a financial institution, together with other banks and also with governments, we can have an impact. And smart cities, are important. People are living more in cities. It will further increase. We have to make the cities more livable for people to, to improve the quality. And also the, the bad activities on oil and gas also impact on the food. These are activities we have to reduce. And that we can expect from financial institutions. And circular economy, sharing cars, sharing houses, sharing food, recycling. These are the activities which we promote. Thematic investing, clean energy, water, waste, diversity, gender equality, 
I live in Belgium, 20% of the Belgian population is not from Belgium. So it's not the same like in the US, but we see also in Europe that yeah, diversity, gender equality is a topic which is very, very important. So it's not on the environmental side, on the S, the social side is very, very important. And education mentioned. So a lot of things to be done. And uh, I'm very happy also to be here in this panel. And I'm also very happy to hear that on the different regions worldwide, that a lot of people, academic people, are trying to find solutions to make our cities better, to improve our cities. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. This is a wonderful contribution from the financial sector, which is, I would say, quite unusual for, for, for the spirit of what has been going on there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. I would like to use the remaining time to make our uh, interaction more two-way. So uh, the members of our audience have the chance to answer any questions you want uh, to all the family mem members. And there is a nice lady there with a microphone that could uh, come to you and you could ask questions. So please, this is your chance and opportunity. And then we will be asking for some closing remarks from the panelists. Let me start the process by asking for the second round of feedbacks, because now our panelists also have heard new things mm -hmm. uh, being contributed by others. So maybe, you know, just a couple of minutes each on what was that particularly was striking for you from the presentations mm -hmm. of other speakers. Let's start with you. Or... Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Schmidt. One thing was very interesting, uh, saying by the representative of Swedish municipalities, for myself, it's a very important key point. Government and local authorities must be careful not to move uh, faster than they are um, able to put in place the conditions required to ensure the success of the reform. That is the example about um, uh, mobility. That is a key of the success of uh, Stockholm and maybe also Oslo because they develop public transportation at the same time they forbidden all cars inside the city. And that is very important. Also, it depends what how colleagues say on my on my left. Um, it depends on social situation. It's not absolutely not um, the same in the suburb, and uh, it's why maybe we can, if we have a smaller uh, map uh, or with a more precise map, we can see the main city is a sustainable city, but around the suburb has a difficulty to reach the same level. Okay, I will address the same question to Tadashi. So from the contributions by other speakers, what was that particularly was striking for you and make you think in a, maybe in a different new way about cities and sustainability? Yes, sure. So I was struck by, <laughs> by a few facts. Um, well, I mean, not facts, but the, the approach that uh, the other speakers, the US uh, colleagues are, are, are talking about. So more concretely, you know, actually, um, and also Sweden, you know, so the factors of success, first of all, really multidimensional by using the, the, the <laughs> your language. We are showing the result of the environmental, mainly, right? Mainly in environmental performance as an indicator, but actually success factors are coming from more wider factors. In the case of San Francisco, it was clearly showing that Sweden as well, you know, institutional background, culture, you know, collaborative approach and, and so on. So actually, <laughs> or, you know, to make cities more sustainable, it's not enough to address the environmental issues like a parts of or technical issues, but actually it's really a unhold of government approaches is, is necessary. So that's a kind of, you know, takeaway from me. And also, I really enjoyed the BNP Paribas uh, intervention because, again, you know, we are talking about money a lot in this, organi in this uh, week, but actually to attract finance or attract investment, again, sustainability is an issue. And, uh, you know, again, the link between economic attractiveness, financial attractiveness is really closely linked uh, with this environment and vice versa. So I just like to so Thanks very much, Tadashi. Uh, let, me, let me turn to, to Professor Dio Tadani. Uh, from the contributions of other speakers, was there something that resonated with you? Was there something that um, made you think about something in a new way? Well, it was more reinforcing a couple of things. I, I think Bian uh, talked about education and tolerance. I think in the end, 
investment in education is probably the most important aspect in terms of increasing productivity, <laughs> uh, reducing racial issues, equity issues, uh, and increasing diversity. So I just want to kind of, you know, reinstate that idea that first off, investment, and I think uh, the Scandinavian countries have done a tremendous job with that, and that's why we see so much success there. Uh, the more educated people are, the more the better the decisions they make in terms of our future. So, and that we, we find that in all those, if you had to do a matrix of the level of education and literacy with your maps, I think we would see a correlation there. And finally, one point I want to add is that, you know, all of us here, most of us here, people in Poland, we all have the opportunity to travel and see really beautiful places. And that what we tend to forget is that beauty is absolutely essential in our human lives, idea of experiencing beauty. And that's something that should not be discounted once you take in all the money and all the policies and all those sort of things, because there are many people in, around the world, in every city, that don't have the opportunity to travel and experience beautiful places. And we need to make sure that when we build cities and start to regenerate cities, that we add the element of beauty and look for things that are beautiful and make these cities beautiful. Because that's what uplifts the human spirit in the end and makes life worth living when we experience those, those aspects of life, a beautiful sunset against a bridge or uh, a mountainscape, uh, whatever it is. So not to forget the notion of instilling beauty in everything that we do. Thank you so much, Jira. Um, let me turn to Bjorn Sigurdsson. You know, you, you come from a place where everything's already pretty much perfect, but have you heard anything exciting among those things that were said by other panelists? And maybe there are some extra thoughts that we could do the second round, you know, of, of, of feedback and cross-pollination. What was it that, that struck you that made you think about uh, cities in a different way? Well, first, I would like to say that um, I think we're doing well. We can do better, but we also need to take care that development doesn't go backwards. So that is maybe today the major challenge for people who think it's important with the sustainability goals and equality and e equality, et cetera, um, to safeguard the um, democracy as a basis, peace and freedom for people. I think it was very reassuring. I know that the finance sector is making a transition but it was really reassurance to hear Guy uh, from, from BNP Paribas that was such a broad and all sector and, and much into details of what you're looking to. So that, that, that reassures that because money is what makes things go around. So it, it has to start there where it stops there, mm. I guess. The cities do have a lot to do with nature-based solutions, and that is for health and well-being and climate adaptation, climate mitigation. It is important. We can do more there. There are great uh, examples. I think the very important the example you had, Rob, from your conversation with, with the journalist here, Peter Godman, and the former ministry, Pagrotsky, why, why, why doesn't people fear uh, disruptive change in industry in Sweden because there at least has been uh, a, a safety net and a focus on, on educating people for new businesses and for new competences and new technology and that gives trust. Safety and trust is as, as well as important. Then you can really do new things, innovate if you are in the trust uh, situations society. Um, Thank you so Thank much, you. Bjorn. Uh, let me uh, turn uh, to um, Dr. Robert Johnson, the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and ask you, Rob, about what was it uh, among the statements and, and the contributions of other speakers that particularly resonated with you and that you would like to emphasize? Thank you. Well, I, I thought uh, Dr. Tudani's emphasis on education was very important, but I want to emphasize that at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, we are bombarded with people that say, 
education cannot just be credentials. You're both educating inputs to production and citizens. The reason I bring that bridge out is I was invigorated. The last speaker spoke about the vitality and contribution of investment. Mark Carney, who's a friend of mine, is very dedicated in that realm. In the United States, we've had a certain extreme polarity whereby people think governance of any form gets in the way of innovation and therefore uh, stifles the opportunities, the possibilities of a new frontier. I think we're in a place now where the investors, and as you, some of you know, I once was a hedge fund partner for many years, they have to think to unleash what we can contribute and to unleash what will make us profitable in innovation. We have to create a more resilient society. I think it's a two-way street here that, how would I say, the lessons of communism, Lenin, Mao, and so forth, are still very powerful. But there is an imbalance with an unfettered free market that may crash the vitality of innovation. And so finding a way to create the enthusiasm, and Bjorn, you just kind of said it, once you generate the trust and the safety, people join the adventure. And I think we're at a critical juncture now, particularly in the context of globalization, where people are afraid that they don't know who or what governs them, that need to invigorate that trust so these people become enthusiastic partners of the kind of potential that the financial sector and, the, and our last presentation illuminated. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, let me turn to our final speaker, um, Mr. Guy Janssen from BNP Paribas, and ask the same question about, you know, cross-pollination of ideas and other things that other speakers have said and conveyed that you, you uh, would like to, you know, comment on or that particularly attracted your attention. Thank you very much. So, so as mentioned before, so the, the financial system is, is in transition, so we are becoming more sustainable. And also, based on all the studies on, on smart cities and, and also sustainable cities. But we still have some challenges. And the challenges are the same that we have in the financial world. Because who are the people who want change? These are the younger people, younger generation. These are mainly also on gender equality, more women. So the older men, which are a big part of our clients, to be honest, and uh, investments, they are very difficult about change. And this is a big challenge for us, and also in, in this industry, philosophy investment. Next to that, we see today that we have a lot of problems in Europe with the problems with Russia and oil and gas. So it's a challenge. Uh, and we see clients coming to us, they say, we want to invest in oil and gas to go for the, the performance, or for, we want to invest in coal. And the performance on coal year to date, it's uh, the last two years, it's impressive, uh, all uh, coal companies. But we also see that the investments, for example, in Germany, we see that in Germany, they invest 100 million extra to protect themselves, but they're going to invest 100, 300 billion in the energy transition to get off the coal and get out of the oil and gas. So the investments that we see in sustainable cities, but also in the energy transition, which is important for the sustainable cities, it's huge. So it's for us an investment story. So the economic reason is there, and that is a big advantage. Uh, it's not only doing good for the society, but also to doing good and also make money with it. And, and that's also mentioned before by other speakers. If we can combine both of it, doing good in society and making money for everybody, then we are good and then we will have success. And that is a challenge that we have and that is what we have to focus on, on the economic reason why we can make cities sustainable. And that should be the focus also from the academic people here in this meeting. What is the economic reason to do this? And then we can go forward and then you will have support of the financial world and also support of the government. So that is my latest mm -hmm. remark. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. And let me, as a matter of closing uh, remarks, 
first of all, flag uh, all the outputs that we have produced over the years, the volumes such as ecological economics, a green economy reader where we brought together all the distinguished speakers and thought leaders on sustainability uh, that uh, the world has seen. Also, the most recent book that I brought here uh, to this podium, Sustainable Cities Reimagined, that actually emerged out of the World Open Forum in Kuala Lumpur. This mm -hmm. is where we had our previous panel that was the highlight of this. And the album Ecosystems that we designed to essentially explain how ecosystems matter, what nature does for us and why we should care. And we ha I'm very pleased to say that we managed to send it out to some leaders around the world and have received nice comments and endorsements and congratulations from people like the president of France and Pope Francis and also Sir David Attenborough. And uh, on this note, I would like to conclude our panel. I would like to thank our speakers uh, very much. And I would like to invite everybody to join us at the end of August in Oxford when we'll be running our executive education program specifically focused on ESG investment, new sustainable business models, and transformation that is required in the context of sustainability transitions. The school will be hosted by a beautiful college called St. Hilda's College on the bank of a little river with an absolutely idyllic setting. And people from 60 other countries liked the program very much and joined over the years. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to discuss things with you. If you would like, you could follow us on social media, um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.